Hey everyone, welcome to Sarah's Cross Dressing Stories. Today I'm going to share with you Sister's Plan and My Beginning, Part 15. If you're new to the channel then please subscribe now for more captivating stories and, please support me on Patreon and get early access at patreon.com slash sarah101. I was sure that somebody had just punched me in the stomach. I couldn't get my breath. I got dizzy. I would have fallen but for my sisters holding on to me long enough for the police officer to reach me from where he had been standing a few feet away. I thought, Daddy dead. Mommy's dead also, maybe? The world started to spin. The police officer picked me up and carried me to the police car. He sat me in the rear seat and went around to the back of the car, then returned with a green cylinder that had a mask attached by a small hose. He put the mask over my face and told me to breathe slowly. In a few minutes everything returned to normal. I thanked him and he stood back so that my sisters could get in the back of the car with me. What happened? I asked. Mary, in between sobs, told me that they had missed the exit and then got a flat tire before they got to the next exit and could turn around. While Daddy was changing it, a truck ran into the back of the car. Daddy was kneeling in front of it, lowering the car back down with the jack, when it was hit. Mother was in the passenger seat and was thrown from the car by the impact. Because it was a warm, sunny day, the car was heating up as it sat next to the highway. My sisters had all gotten out to stand under a nearby shade tree until the tire was changed or they would have been injured and possibly killed, as well. Just minutes before, a state police car had stopped to check on why they were stopped on the thruway. He had passed, then pulled over and backed up. He had determined that they didn't need a tow and was preparing to leave when the truck hit my family's car. My father was instantly crushed between the two cars. The state police officer just narrowly missed being crushed as well. The front passenger side door was open and mother was thrown about 30 feet. Her broken and bloody body landed not far from my sister's. They ran to her but were afraid to touch her for fear of injuring her more. The police officer used his still-functioning radio to call the accident in and other police cars started arriving within five minutes. Two ambulances came and the attendants all worked at stabilizing my mother and preparing her for transport. My father had been killed immediately and there was nothing that they could do for him except cover his body. The truck driver staggered from his cab and the police officer had gone to find out the extent of his injuries. Upon finding that the man had no injuries at all, but could not stand up without holding on to something, he arrested him for driving while intoxicated. With his hands handcuffed behind him, the driver was left to sit off the side of the road until a car was available to transport him. Within minutes, my sisters said, he had fallen asleep and was snoring as he lay on his side in the dirt. Mother was transported to a nearby hospital and my sisters were taken there by a state police officer. The police officer filled out a report as soon as my sisters were coherent enough. Since father was an only child and both sets of grandparents were deceased, our only living relative is mother's sister Catherine, who lives somewhere in Texas. Mrs. Marcotti had been contacted, since my sisters had named her as the nearest family friend. Mrs. Marcotti and her husband immediately left for the hospital, while Mrs. Marcotti's sister came over to stay with Gina and Maria. The trip to the hospital in upstate New York took three hours. When the Marcotas arrived, my sisters again broke down as they recounted the tragedy. After several more hours, someone thought to inquire about my absence and a plan was adopted to find me with the help of the New York and New Jersey State Police Agencies. 
My two younger sisters were transported to a NJ police barracks and then to my home to find out if I was there. Judy remained with the Marcotas until they learned mother's status. The state police officer took us to the Marcotis' house to await the news after Mrs. Marcotis' sister was notified that we would be coming. The New York State Police said they would locate my Aunt Catherine and inform her of the accident. I was still in shock as we were led into Marcotis' house. Gina and Maria kissed and hugged Susan, Mary, and I, and then we all cried together. The state police officer had left after talking with Mrs. Marcotti's sister briefly. My sisters, the Marcotti girls, and myself sat up all night, sobbing and crying with one another. Mrs. Marcotti's sister wisely did not try to force any of us to go to sleep, but went into her sister's bedroom to take a nap herself. Eventually, we all fell asleep in each other's arms during the night and we slept fitfully. The next morning, we sat around spiritless waiting for word of mother's condition. Around noon, Mrs. Marcotti called to say that mother was in critical condition in the intensive care ward, but the doctors were optimistic that she would live. They would know for sure within 48 hours. It would be that long before anyone would be allowed to see her, as she was heavily sedated following the hours of operations. For that reason, she and Mr. Marcotti were returning home with Judy. The news that mother was alive and would probably recover was welcome indeed. We would now begin to grieve over father, whose death had taken a back seat place to mother's condition. It wasn't that we had forgotten about father, rather the condition of the living, remaining parent had taken an uppermost place in our minds. In spite of the grieving that we were enduring, fatigue caught up with us and we were forced to go to sleep. My sisters and I lay down together, fully clothed, in Maria's bed while Maria shared Gina's bed. When we awoke, Mrs. Marcotti and her husband had returned. It was six o'clock Monday evening and we awoke to the aroma of pasta sauce cooking in the kitchen. I had not eaten since the Dodge City hot dogs, and my sisters hadn't eaten since Sunday breakfast. We pulled ourselves together and went downstairs to find out what was going on. Judy was asleep on the couch in the living room. We went into the kitchen and Mrs. Marcotti walked over and embraced us. She said that they had arrived home several hours ago but did not want to wake us. Mr. Marcotti had gone out to get some milk and things and should be back any minute. As she finished, the front door bell rang. She said that her husband must have forgotten his key again. She asked me to please let him in. I went to the front door and pulled it open. There, in front of me, stood my mother. Mommy, I shouted and jumped to embrace her. Then I stopped when I realized that it wasn't her. The woman in front of me looked just like her, but the hairdo was different and she looked a little younger. The woman gave me a sad smile and said, Hello, David. Aunt Catherine? I asked meekly. She nodded and stepped forward with her arms out. I went into her arms and hugged her while she hugged me. My sisters had heard me when I shouted and had come running. They saw me hugging my mother's look-alike and ran up to us. They realized as quickly as I had who it was. We had never met our aunt before, but there was no doubt as to who she was. Mrs. Marcotti had come out of the kitchen, and now Mr. Marcotti returned from the store. My sisters had joined us in the embrace. Welcome to our home, Mrs. Bliss, Mr. Marcotti said. Let's get inside and we'll do proper introductions. Judy had awoken with all the commotion, and Gina and Maria had come downstairs. They now joined the crowd as everybody was introduced. 
After kisses, hugs, and a little more weeping, Mrs. Marcotti said, Dinner is ready. Everybody into the dining room. There's no food worse in this world than overcooked pasta. Over dinner, my sisters related the events again. They sobbed as they told the story. In spite of the solemnity, they ate their meal in order to satisfy the pangs of hunger, which resulted from a day and a half without food. Aunt Catherine listened in silence. When they finished, Mrs. Marcotti filled in what she knew of mother's current condition. Then, Aunt Catherine indicated what she would like to do. We should return to our house and get cleaned up and organized. First thing tomorrow, we would drive up to the hospital to see mother and talk with the doctors. There were other things to do such as talking to our school and the police and making funeral arrangements. Mr. Marcotti gave her directions to the hospital and the state police barracks. We finished eating and Aunt Catherine said that we should be going. We all thanked Mr. and Mrs. Marcotti for all that they did to help us. We said goodbye to them and to Gina and Maria and left after promising to keep them informed about mother's condition and the other matters. It was good to get home. Being back in comfortable and familiar surroundings helped to reduce the anxiety that we were feeling. It didn't diminish our grief, but it did help us to deal with it a little better. We were able to clean ourselves up and change our clothes. Once we finished, we all sat down to talk with Aunt Catherine at the kitchen table. This was the first time that any of us had met her but it turned out that she would have instantly recognized any of us. Mother had been sending her pictures of us since we were born. I couldn't help but grin a little when she said that it was nice to see that I had finally grown some hair. I knew she was trying to lighten the conversation a little by referring to the old BNW pictures of me where I looked bald because of my short light hair. I asked why she had never come to visit us. She said that it was a silly reason and now she regrets it more than ever. Prior to mother's marriage, she had gotten into a terrible argument with father. She vowed never to visit while mother shared a roof with father. She advised mother to break her engagement because father was a any or do well who would never amount to anything. Mother was heartbroken when she even refused to attend Mother's wedding 15 years ago. But in spite of Aunt Catherine's dislike for Father, she and Mother maintained a close, sisterly relationship over the years through the post. Father refused to allow any mention of her name in our house. Aunt Catherine told us that she regretted her words, and although Father had proved her predictions to be wrong, her stubborn pride had prevented her from trying to mend the broken fences. She said that father had shown himself to be a good and dependable husband and father. She was sorry that she was not able to tell him and apologize for those words spoken in anger so many years ago. As she talked, we began to see how very much like mother she was. At ten o'clock, Aunt Catherine told us that it was time for bed. We have a busy day ahead of us tomorrow. We all went upstairs together, prepared ourselves for bed, and retired for the night. Aunt Catherine would stay in Mother's room. I lay awake for some time thinking about the events of the past two days. I wept again when I thought how I would never again talk with Father. And I wept as I imagined my mother's broken body on the highway. I wanted to be brave tomorrow, so I was hoping to get cried out tonight. I finally drifted into a fitful sleep. I dreamt about trucks crashing into our car and our bodies flying through the air to land broken and bloody. I woke up very early, my pillow and sheets soaked from sweat. I got up and went into the bathroom to take a bath, where I allowed myself to soak in the warm water.
It relaxed me after the tense night of constant nightmares. When I got out, dried off and dressed, it was still dark outside, so I went downstairs. I made a cup of cocoa for myself and sat in the dimly lit kitchen to drink it. Susan came in just as I was about to take my first sip. I asked her if she'd like some and when she said yes, I got another cup out of the cupboard and divided it up between us. I had brought down two of my new vitamin capsules since I had not taken one yesterday. Susan asked me about them and I told her what they were. She asked if she could try one. I told her that mother had made me promise not to share any as they could cause her, Judy or Mary, to become very sick. You know that I would give you anything that I have, I said, but I don't want you to get ill. We sat there in silence, holding hands, and sipping our cocoa, until the first rays of the sun peeked into the kitchen window. Judy and Mary came into the kitchen to find us still sitting there. They came over to us and we embraced as a group. Aunt Catherine walked in to find us like that. Good morning, children. It looks like it will be a beautiful day for our drive to visit Liz. Er, your mother. Good morning, Aunt Catherine, we all chorused. My sisters unlocked from our embrace and began to prepare breakfast. A whirlwind of activity produced the meal in record time. Aunt Catherine busied herself with the telephone. She carried a book, about the size of a diary, but many times thicker. As she spoke on the phone, she made constant notes. I heard her call our school and inform them of the events, and she told them that we would be out for the remainder of the week. She requested that copies of homework assignments be given to Gina Marcotti so that we could keep up with our schoolwork. She called the car rental agency and arranged for her car to be picked up, as she would use mother's car for the duration of her stay. She was incredibly organized and each call lasted only long enough for the purpose to be achieved. She didn't employ any of the chit-chat and social pleasantries that mother always used when making calls. When breakfast was ready, Judy called to her and she joined us. While we sat and waited for her to say grace, she started to munch a piece of toast and look at her notes. She suddenly realized that we were staring at her. She stopped eating and noticing our hands on the edge of the table, put down the toast and folded her own hands. She said, I'm sorry, too many years of living alone. Judy, would you give the invocation? We thank thee, Lord, for this thy bounty, Judy stated, then added, We would like to ask that you look after Mother and speed her recovery, and please look after Daddy. He's with you now. Amen. Amen, we all echoed. As we started to eat, I asked, Aunt Catherine, I thought that you were married, but you just said that you had spent years alone? Yes, David. Do you remember about five years ago that your mother came to visit me for two weeks? Yes. Well, that was when my husband passed away. I know that my stupid feud with your father prevented any contact with all of you, or even of my name being mentioned openly in this house. It is my own fault and I don't blame your dad. Anyway, my husband, Gregory Arthur Bliss, Gabby to his friends, because of his initials, not because he talked too much, passed away after being injured at an oil drilling site. Your mother flew down immediately to help me through that darkest period of my life. I loved Gabby fiercely, and have not remarried. I run our little oil drilling company, and that keeps me pretty busy. How long can you stay with us, Aunt Catherine, I asked. I am here to help get you through this terrible chapter in your young lives. We're family and family does for one another. I hope that we can become good friends now that we have been brought back together by this unhappy circumstance. I don't want you to worry. 
I'll take good care of you until your mother is able to resume the job. I got up from my chair and went over to her. I put my arms around her neck and hugged her saying, Thank you, Aunt Catherine, I'm glad that you're here. We need you. My sisters all came over and joined us in the embrace. When we had straightened back up and returned to our seats, I noticed that Aunt Catherine's eyes were a bit misty. She took a tissue from her pocket and blew her nose. It makes me sad, she said, when I think of what my stubborn pride has kept me from enjoying all these years. I understood, at that moment, that Aunt Catherine had intense feelings of loneliness in her heart. They were feelings that I recognized well since I shared those same feelings. I felt even closer to her now. That's all for now, see you in the next video. Please share your valuable opinion and please support me on Patreon to get the early access. Link in the first comment.